Nowadays, you don't have to be world famous to have devoted fans. For one minor celebrity, her biggest fan began to do some things that were rather... creepy. My name is Georgia Sumner. I'm an actress. Not to be confused with the word celebrity. I'm simply an actress. I act to make money so that I can live. I mostly do commercials and have had bit parts in several big budget movies, but I got a huge break about a year ago when I was cast in a superhero movie. I played a newspaper reporter and was in several significant scenes. Since then, I've had a lot more work in movies. Still smaller parts, but let me tell you something about the acting world. Those smaller parts still pay very well. But don't get me wrong, I'm not rich. Far from it. Most people with 40 hour a week jobs make more money than I do. I'm not complaining, just stating a fact and making sure it's clear that I'm not rich and famous and that I'm leagues away from celebrity status. That being said, I'm still in the public eye and somehow I have fans. Several of them. I actually get fan mail and autograph requests. It's pretty neat. At least it was. There's one fan in particular that has made me wish that I didn't have any fans at all. He initially reached out to me on social media. I'm not a social media hound, not even close. If I weren't an actress, I wouldn't be on social media at all, but part of my job is promoting my work, so I have no choice. My fan initially sent me a simple message. It read, Hi Georgia, I love your work. I'm your biggest fan. Innocent enough, right? I replied back by saying, Thanks so much. I forgot all about it because I had gotten a lot of messages like that. A week later, he messaged me again. Hi, this is Brad, your biggest fan. Thanks for replying to my message. It means a lot. If you're ever in Bowling Green, Kentucky, you have a place to stay. I wrote back, Thanks, Brad. His reply was, You are welcome. And you are pretty. I didn't reply back. It was a week later when I received a text message on my phone from a number I didn't recognize. It read, Guess who? I had no idea who it was, so I typed back. The correspondence went as follows. I have no idea. It's your biggest fan, remember me? My name is Brad. How did you get my number, Brad? It's easy to find out people's phone numbers in this day and age. I don't mean to be rude, Brad, but I use this phone for business only. If you'd like to message me, please use social media. He didn't respond back and a week went by without hearing any more from him. I was hoping that was the end of it, but then I received another text message from him. It's me again. Hey, I'm in Woodland Hills. Any chance you can put me up for the night? This was getting creepy. It was easy for a fan to guess that I lived in Los Angeles, California because that's where a lot of acting work is. But Woodland Hills is a specific neighborhood in the San Fernando Valley. And that just so happened to be where my apartment was. He knew where I lived. I probably shouldn't have replied back, but I did. I was trying to be nice and politely discourage him. Brad, I'm out of town for work. I wouldn't be able to put you up anyhow. I just have a small one-bedroom apartment. I lied. I wasn't out of town for work. I was hoping that telling him that I was would motivate him to go back to his home state. He replied back, I know you're not out of town. I saw you this morning at Kirchhoff's coffee shop. This sent chills down my spine. I was at Kirchhoff's coffee shop that morning. He was stalking me. He continued, As far as the one bedroom goes, not a problem. I hope your bed is small. I like to cuddle. I was freaking out. I called the police and got nowhere since there was never a threat made. They suggested I block his number, so I did. 
Later that night, I got a text from a different number. It was Brad again. You blocked my number? You bitch. You didn't really think I'd go away that easily, did you? Take a look outside your window. I was reluctant to do as he said, but I wanted to see what kind of game he was playing. I moved to the front of my apartment and slowly pulled the curtain back. On the corner of the street, I saw a broad-shouldered man in a black jacket and black knitted cap. He was staring at me and then held up his hand and waved. I was so scared I lost my breath. I called the police. They said there was not much they could do since he was on a public street and hadn't threatened me. They told me they'd have a car do a few extra rounds by my apartment building that night. I was quite frazzled. A few hours later I looked out the window again and didn't see Brad. I did see a police car slowly drive down the road, so that made me feel better. It took me forever to get to sleep that night, but when I did, I slept soundly. It had been a chilly night and I had covered myself up with a heavy blanket. When I woke up the next morning, the blanket was on the floor. I looked down at my uncovered body and noticed my nightgown had been hiked up to my chest, revealing my cotton panties. I looked up at the mirror on the wall across from my bed. There was a message scrawled across it with lipstick that read, Nice panties. I love you. Your biggest fan. I screamed. Since then, I moved into an apartment with two other people, so I'm rarely home alone. I usually have someone drive me to work and back. Always having someone near me makes me feel safer, but I'm never fully at ease. Even though I haven't heard from Brad since that night, I fear the day when I look at my phone and see another message from my biggest fan. Forgotten Time I live in Louisville, Kentucky and had to go to Nashville, Tennessee on business. It's about a two and a half hour drive from Louisville to Nashville. When I take a little road trip like that, I like to leave a day early, drive the back roads, and see some sights. There's a lot to see between Louisville and Nashville. On this particular trip, I made a stop in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and visited Mammoth Cave. It happens to be the longest cave system known in the entire world. They have a bunch of different cave tours to choose from. I made a point to choose one that didn't require much in the way of climbing and crawling. At 62 years old, my knees aren't what they once were. I opted for a tour called the Great Onyx Lantern Tour. It was breathtakingly beautiful. There was a wealth of geological formations that sparkled by the lantern's light. From there, I made a quick stop in Russellville, Kentucky to see a bank the James Gang robbed back in 1868. The bank is still standing. As a matter of fact, it has since been turned into a residence. After that, I planned to stop at a gigantic antique store in Springfield, Tennessee, called the Antique Barn. Springfield, Tennessee is approximately 40 minutes from Russellville, Kentucky. I left Russellville at 2 o'clock p.m. Imagine my surprise when I arrived at the antique barn, only to find it closed. I was extremely disappointed. I had called them earlier that day to confirm their hours. They told me they'd be open until 5 p.m. Why had they closed so early? I looked at my watch and was shocked to see the time was 5.45. I immediately started tapping my watch to get it working again. I mean, it had to be broken, right? I pulled my cell phone from my pocket to see what the actual time was. 5.45 p.m. I knew this couldn't be correct. I left Russellville at 2 o'clock. It didn't take me three and a half hours to get to Springfield. This was nuts. I drove down the road to a nearby bank that had the time flashing on their sign outside. The clock confirmed that my watch and cell phone were correct. I was dumbfounded. I felt like I was in a bit of a daze. 
Where had the time gone? Suddenly, I was overtaken by fatigue, accompanied by a pounding headache. I got myself a room at a local inn and collapsed onto the bed, immediately falling into a deep sleep. I had nightmares that night. I dreamt of being on the road between Russellville and Springfield. I took a longer route than most people might, through some peaceful, lonely back roads. The sun was growing bright in the sky, and then brighter. It was zooming toward me at blinding speed, and then all at once it stopped and was hovering over my car. I don't know why I had stopped my car, but I did. And everything was silent. There were no birds chirping, no insects bustling, nothing but stillness. Then I felt as though I were floating. I looked down and could see my car beneath me. It was growing smaller as I floated higher. Within seconds, everything changed from the magnificent bright to a deafening black. I could feel myself being immersed in some kind of a thick liquid. I felt as though I were swimming in the deepest depths of the ocean. The silence of the blackness was shattered by a constant hissing sound. It was a cross between a snake and a dentist's drill. My back suddenly felt cold. I felt as though I had been laid upon a block of ice, and above me I was blinded by overhead lights. Occasionally a silhouette of a head would shield the lights. A large, bulbous head. It was not of this earth. I could feel cold, metallic-like objects probing at my body. While this did not hurt, it was extremely intrusive, and I had an overwhelming sense of being violated. I found myself floating upward toward the light, and then my body spun around, and I was facing downward. I could feel myself being lowered softly. It was now the front of my body that was lying on the icy table, and I could feel an array of hands moving up and down my back. The hands felt feminine. They were warm and slender. I felt like I could have tricked myself into believing it was a massage if I wanted to, but I knew that's not what they were doing. They were exploring my body with curiosity. I was terrified when the hands left my body and were replaced by some type of sharp, thin object. I felt a large needle being dragged over my back. The needle was slowly moved up my neck and came to a rest in an area behind my left ear. It sat there, nearly piercing my flesh, for a few seconds before I experienced a jolt of pain. It felt like the needle was being shoved through my entire skull. I woke up in a cold sweat and panting. I was exhausted. I didn't feel like I had rested at all, and although I call it a nightmare, it felt more like an encounter. Like it really happened. I stood in front of the mirror in the bathroom and looked my body over. There was no evidence of trauma. I turned around and looked at my back the best I could. I halfway expected to see my back covered in scratch marks, but nothing. I could easily brush those memories off as a nightmare, but I could not account for those lost hours of time. It was bizarre. The next day, when my business meeting had concluded, one of my associates approached me and pointed at the back of my head. What happened? I shrugged. What do you mean? She moved her finger closer to the back of my head. Right there. She positioned me in front of some reflective glass, took a compact mirror out of her purse, and held it behind my head so that I could see the large, red, puncture wound behind my left ear. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button. I'll be back soon with another scary story.